A very good morning to all of you gathered here this morning. And may I ask you to please stand as we start with the service. I am the resurrection and I am the life. He who believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. I know that my Redeemer lives and that in the end he will stand upon the earth. I myself will see him with my own eyes, I and not another. Do not bring your servant into judgment, for no one living is righteous before you. I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, no powers, no things present, no things to come, no height, no death, no anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Remember not the sins of my youth, nor my transgressions, but according to your mercy think on me. We brought nothing into the world and we take nothing out. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know, even as also I am known. None of us lives to himself and none of us dies to himself. If we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. The eternal God is your refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you. I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. We believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so it will be for those who died as Christians. God will bring them to life with Jesus. Thus we shall always be with the Lord. Comfort one another with these words. Heavenly Father, in your Son, Jesus Christ, you have given us a true faith and a sure hope. Help us to live as those who believe in the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, and the resurrection to eternal life, and strengthen this faith and hope in us all the days of our life, through the love of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. As we gather this morning in celebrating the life of Moigua, I want to start or begin by uh, welcoming in our midst um, the Dean of Johannesburg, uh, the Rever very Reverend Kolani Joati, who will be preaching at this service this morning. Um, okay, maybe I should have also mentioned that, that I am Reverend Moses Tabete, rector of this parish, St. Michael's in Bryanston, and also welcoming Father Clayton Muitziwa, who is the rector of the parish of St. Michael's in Alexander, and now together with Bramley. And on the far end there we have Father Matthew Wright, who is the assistant priest here at, at St. Michael's. Um, but I also want to, in a very special way, welcome you, the two families, the Susulu and the Jackson family, to this service of comfort. And we prayed God that he would be present to us and to you all together as we enter into this act of worship, that God may bring con comfort and consolation um, to you. At times like this, it's, it's never a good thing to start singling people out in terms of welcoming 
people by name, um, but I know that it is right and proper uh, to welcome uh, Me Zodwa and U Makulu and the rest of the sibling and brothers and sisters. So I just pray that as we begin this service, that we may all be united in heart and in soul as we honor the life of Meiwa, Moigwa. And we pray that God would be present to us in that way. So let we now begin with an opening prayer. <clears throat> o God, whose mercies cannot be numbered, Accept our prayers on behalf of your servant Moigwa and grant him an entrance into the land of light and joy in the fellowship of your saints through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. I should have mentioned at the beginning as well that um, part and parcel of, of Anglicanism uh, any Anglican service that you go to, it's actually an aerobic session at the same time. Uh, because you are, at different times, you'll be asked to stand and to sit and stand and sit. So if you are wearing your Fitbit, um, you should be okay at the end of the, of, the, of the service. And so I'm now going to ask you to stand as we listen to the first hymn, Amazing Grace.
we please be seated. We will now move into a time of eulogies and tributes. After the first two eulogies, we will have a hymn, and then the last two eulogies after the hymn. So without any further ado, I would like to invite Uncle Max Susulu to come and say something and offer a tribute. Good afternoon, all. My name is Max Fuisi Lesisulu. I'm the eldest in the family, and I welcome you all here. I <clears throat> it's a very painful occasion for me and I feel it deeply. I find the pain too much. I asked my wife, you know, to pay the tribute. When I spoke at the funeral of my brother Zuelake in 2012, I complained that he did not follow protocol. It was not right for him, the younger one, to leave this world before his two older brothers, Mlumisi and myself. Never in a million years would I have dreamed that I would have to stand up to speak at the funeral of his son, Moigwa. This defies the nat natural order of things. I would have expected Moigwa to bury me, and yet here I am today, in this moment of total heartbreak and devastation. The pain is indescribable. In the past few days, my mind has been going back to a reunion I had with my brother in 1985. Zuelake had just finished his stint as an Eman Fellow at Harvard, and he and his family stopped in London en route to South Africa. After I went into exile in 1963, I had not seen any member of my family until I was sent on an ANC mission to Swaziland in 1974. I was then able to spend some quality time with my sister, Lindiwe, who was at university in Swaziland. My siblings, Mlungisi, Beryl, Zuelake, Nguli, and my son, Mlungisi Jr., were all part of the delegation that traveled from South Africa to see me. Mlungisi was accompanied by his wife, Sheila, but Zuelake was not married at the time. He was then a young cadet journalist with the Rand Daily Mail. So when the opportunity came a decade later to meet my brother and his family, I jumped at the opportunity. I traveled from the Netherlands, where I was studying at the time, to London. Uh, I invited Eleanor to join me. It was a joy to meet Zuelake and his family. It was fascinating for me to see the wild, mischievous little brother of my childhood grown into a responsible family man and doting father of two adorable children. We admired Zodwa's calm handling of Moigwa 
an energetic and curious little one who, after a year in Harvard, had developed an American accent, which I found very amusing. In 1991, I returned home from exile and had the opportunity to get acquainted to a big gang of nephews and nieces. After a couple of decades in exile, it was a joy to be able to watch all the young ones grow into responsible adults, taking on increasing family responsibilities. Moigua always stepped up to the plate when he needed to, playing a central role in organizing family events. When we buried our son Mulungisi in 2008, Moigua was at our gates to collect us early on the morning of the funeral. That is something we will never forget. In the difficult years after the passing of both my brothers, Mwigwa would pitch up unannounced to spend time with me. He would come in like a breath of fresh air or a warm ray of sunshine on a wintry day. I looked forward to those visits and I am struggling to come to terms with the fact that I will never enjoy the pleasure of them again. A couple of years ago, we were invited to the welcoming of Moi's second daughter, and we were so happy that Moi had found happiness with Aisha. We were delighted to learn of the birth of Melo Gulle. Our devastation at the way things have turned out is profound. We are at a loss for words. All we can say to Aisha is that we stand by you. We cannot, we not, cannot take away your pain and grief but we will be there for you to assist you in whatever way we can. Uh, Lilita, the relationship you had with your father was beautiful. We hope your knowledge that he loved you so much and that he was extremely proud of you will comfort you. Zodwa, we have experienced the pain of losing a child and we are saddened that you have to go through the same. It is a pain like no other. We are glad that you have Mamkulu, Zoya, Ziega, Noabi around you to light, and the rest of the family to lighten the, try to lighten the burden. I think I can speak on behalf of all my siblings when I say that we love Moi dearly, dearly, and we will cherish, cherish his memory forever. Lala Nokolo Mzondi Omle. Good afternoon. Um, Father Kolan, each Sunday when we sing hymns, we do not understand the meaning. But this morning, the hymn chosen by Zodwa, Amazing Grace, tells a story from the beginning to the end. And one believes that in her prayers, it was a prayer for something like this amazing grace. Earlier on, Vuvu, in the clips that we saw, you mentioned praying. Yes, we did pray. But what were we praying for? Were we being selfish and wanting moigua? to suffer the way he did so that you can all enjoy all the positive things that we heard about him. But we were saying as mothers, yes, Lord, give him eternal rest and we know that life will go on. Zodwa, in your family, everybody has a name with the initial Z. But Moikwa decided to deviate from this Z and say, my son is going to be called Melogul. 
But as we were grieving the passing of Melok of Moikwa, I got to understand the meaning of Melogule. Ukuti Ngempela Kuzubagule in this family. Cockophilis. We we learned in the books that there was a Mother Teresa. But for us, and for Zodra in particular, there couldn't have been a better Mother Teresa than you, who looked after Melokuhle for five days after his birth until today, which is six weeks later, when both Aisha and Moigwa were in hospital. It is incredible when you see that little young man, how sprightly he is, yet he missed the nurturing. I'm, I'm not sure, but I'm told that mother's breast milk you can smell. But Melogule is fortunate to have had you and you were able to share your love that you have for your daughter. Aisha, Aisha, you are very special. Zodo is my younger sister, but I can tell you there are certain values that are in her that you have. And I can bet you, if Moi was here and I would ask him and say, why of all the women you picked on Aisha to be your life partner, you would say, You've got the attributes of my mother. My sister has been going through pain, and it's been painful. But you, you, Aisha, eased that pain. You eased it, and you took the load away from her. Zora is a very quiet person, seeing you know her. Even showing her emotions, for me, is very difficult. But we knew that if there was a problem, there was a phone call away, we would call Aisha, and amicably, in a most humble way, she would come back to us with a solution. We speak of frontline workers, and here I'd like to pay tribute, even though we eventually lost Moigwa, to the staff at the Morningside clinics clinic. Every day we were reassured and we had the hope. But we want to thank them for the kindness and allowing us because during this period it is even difficult for us to see a loved one. But we know for a fact that Moigwa we had to give up through that. We thank them for, for that. The numerous messages, some of us are BBT, born before technology, but the numerous messages that everybody brought through to us uh, are amazing. And we thank you for the support that you've given the Sisulu family. Kokanela omzondi, omasoka, patibaya bulela, gogutin bakrinele intombiabo enguzoto. Simply because you were all there for her. Kinyi, we talk about going into people's shoes. I know Ufa that Habeti said we shouldn't mention Amakam. But you, you like took Putlungi's role so aptly, and we thank you for that. We are indeed saddened by the passing away of Moigwa. And Minage Umuigo Wangens are famous because I've got a second name. I don't know why my parents gave me one name. So my second name is Mamkul. So that the whole community, the cousins and the nieces, call me Gogo Kulu or whatever. But we are here to say thank you to all of you for giving us the support. And to you, Aisha, you have a challenge. But with God's grace, we know you will manage. Uh, 
Thank you, Uncle Max and Mam Kulu Nomvuyo for those wonderful tributes and words of comfort. Shall we please stand and sing the second hymn, Breathe on me, breath of God. Jackson uh, to pay tribute and he will be followed by Lilita Wayigwa's daughter. protective brother. Thank you, Corey. Um, thank you. I didn't honestly know how I was going to get through this. Um, and I've been begging Moi to come see me spiritually because it's just been so difficult. And then this morning as I was finishing my speech, he came and he gave me such a big hug and I felt so strong. Because with Moi by your side, you can do anything. This feels so surreal. You never imagined doing this at 34, so in love after five years and with two children under two years old. Where do I begin to even talk about this incredible man that I loved unconditionally and changed my life forever? Over the past week, you've heard about Moikwa, the leader, visionary, disruptor, businessman, activist, philanthropist, brother, son, uncle, and nephew and cousin. Today, I want to share a different side of Moi, Moi as a committed life partner and dad. He is a very private person by nature, but even more private about his family. But I thought it was important to share just how loving and selfless he was even at home. Moika was a gift from the moment I met him 
on the 18th of February, 2017, at 8.05 p.m. I was at Grayston Shopping Center with one of my best friends walking across the parking lot when we heard, hi ladies, in this charming voice. At that point in my life, I was so over men. So as I turned around to dismiss him, I was completely caught off guard by his infectious smile, warm soul, and just how handsome he was. I was enamored. We were trying to buy some wine, so, we offered, so he offered to buy it for us, but it came with T's and C's. He said, you know, terms and conditions. My heart melted. I'm a businesswoman, and now this guy is talking to me in business jargon. Oh my God, I thought to myself. As my heart began to beat faster, I calmly asked, what are those terms and conditions? He replied, I'll buy you two bottles, one for us to sit down and have now, and another for you to take with you. He was so suave. By this point, I'm giving my friend the eyes, I need a wingman, this guy is so interesting. We sit down and we begin to converse, and the conversation is flowing like we've known each other forever. I'm dying of laughter because of how funny he is, and his gentle, kind soul is radiating and speaking to me. We also dis discuss travel because he had just gotten off a flight from Haiti, Miami, and London, I low-key start to hyperventilate because I love to travel too. Is this guy real? My soul immediately connected with his. I felt at home. I felt safe. And we haven't left each other's side since. I call him Lava. Not lover, but Lava with an A. I'm not sure where that term came from, but it was my term of endearment that just came to me for him. It stands for lover, committed partner, best friend, mentor, father of my children, my confidant, my family, my pillar. I miss him so much. I miss my best friend. It was a privilege and an honor to be loved by him. I'm not oblivious to the fact that most people in their lifetime don't get to experience the type of connection, spiritual bond and love that we have. Three months into dating, the late Tata Zolake came to me in one of my dreams and told me to sit down on a bench next to him and we had a loving, caring conversation. This compounded with other moments made me realize Moye and I's relationship was more than this physical world. Before we had kids, we spent a lot of time together discussing anything and everything. As I've heard, he does that with everyone. <laughs> our, talked about business, our ideas, companies, projects, politics, activism, our friends and family, helping other people, the future and our future. But I can just listen to him for hours. His mind is extraordinary. He was wise beyond his years and his intelligence unimaginable. We did exciting things like travel to Hong Kong and London and Dubai, Atlanta. We would go to art auctions and wineries. He helped me look and think about life differently. But we also enjoyed the simple things just as much just the two of us on a couch together. Matter of fact, that's how we spent every single New Year's Eve. It was all we needed, each other. When I lost my aunt, then my grandmother and grandfather three years in a row, he was there for me physically and emotionally, making sure I made it to the US so I could be with my family. He came to to support me because that's the man he is supportive in your time of need. When he met my family a few months into our relationship, they all instantly bonded. He folded right in. There was a similar easiness when I met his gracious, loving family, which made me fall even more in love with him because I knew who he was raised by and with. The Susudu family has been unbelievably welcoming, caring, and loving throughout the time that I've known them 
and most especially during this difficult time. Mori and I are both contemporary, so we started our family not in the traditional way. I gave birth to our beautiful daughter, Naya, in November 2019, but I had no reservations because I had met and was spending time with Lita, his daughter. I got to experience their inseparable bond and its exceptional parenting skills. The way he allowed Lita to be her own person, but also guide her. The way he exposed her and stretched her mind, but still loved and protected her. Lita is smart, witty, and so mature, always has been, and I knew that was a result of him. Six weeks ago, I gave birth to our second child, an adorable son, Melo Kuthle, who Moi named. I see Moi's handsome and thoughtful nature in Melo. I see his humor and mischievousness in Naya, and I see his wit and intelligence in Lita. And for this, I am grateful. I will miss him coming home in time to play with Naya before she goes to sleep. It was their time together and him going to get her in her crib when she wakes up too early and the three of us lie in bed together talking and playing before the day starts. I said to Naya, our 20 month, 21 month old yesterday, who's looking after you? Because she came running into Moi and I's room and she responded, Moi? She still calls for him every day. She loves her father so much, just like Lita. And it kills me that Melo Kuthle only had two weeks with him. <laughs> I feel like a part of me died on Saturday. And it did. What many of you don't know is Moy is my angel. He saved my life. We were diagnosed with COVID shortly after I gave birth. Went to the doctors and tried to ride out the 10 days at home. During those days, our whole family got COVID except my mom. I've never seen someone so worried like Moy was. My mom told me in the middle of the night while he was sick, he would go around to Naya and myself and check on us and do our temperatures and make sure we were still breathing. He was selfless to a thought and so loving. On day 11, Moy and I declined dramatically out of nowhere, but fortunately he had already called our family doctor to come to our home. After observation, the doctor called an ambulance immediately and sent us to the ER, where we were both diagnosed with severe COVID pneumonia. In true Moi style, he was joking the entire ride to the hospital, like we both weren't sick. The doctors later told me if we hadn't come, we both would have died the next day. Moi saved my life. <laughs> He sacrificed himself for me and our family. That was him. They separated us in the hospital, but I visited him every day. For four weeks, we had beautiful conversation that lifted his spirit and mine. The day before he passed, we had our last dance to For You by Kenny Lattimore. It was so special and something I will treasure forever as well as being by his side as he transitioned Saturday morning. Moi was a fighter. He was a fighter for his family, for his friends, for his community, South Africa, and generally anyone in need, and he fought until the end. I'm so proud of him and everything he's accomplished in his lifetime. All the people he's impacted, sometimes I think he was just too good for this world. I love everything about him, his mind, his generosity, his patience, his vision, his protectiveness, his physical touch, his voice, his style, his humor, his laugh. He made me laugh every day for the past five years. He was a gentleman and a gentleman. He gave 
his all to every, he gave his all to as many people as he could. I now fully understand when one partner goes, why the other chooses to go as well. Because the pain is unbearable and there's nothing that can take it away. I ask myself, will my heart ever heal? And I think I know the answer to that already and just have to come to peace with it. But I also know that I have an angel watching over me and our family who he was, who had unwavering love and commitment to. He gave everything he had to us and more. He was our provider, our protector, our pillar, and our cheerleader. Moi, I promise to keep your spirit alive. I promise to take care of and raise our ch children, Naya and Melo, with you in mind and spirit as independent thinkers and doers. I promise to care and love for Lilita. Thank you for being such an incredible partner. I miss my person every day, and I want my best friend back. He made life worth living. I just want to close with something I titled, titled In Sickness and in Health, because it was the last thing he said to me in the hospital as they wheeled me out of his room and put him on the ventilator. And it's something I was fortunate enough to share during our visits. Neither of us are perfect, but we are perfect for each other. There's a patience we have to work through hard things. There's an enjoyment and fun we have when we are together doing simple things. There's an unconditional love that we have that can never be broken and is now forever sewn together through our children, Naya and Melo. They are a beautiful manifestation of our love. Thank you for loving me at my best and my worst. Thank you for being my home. Something I knew the first time I turned around and saw you. Your face lit up my soul, and I knew I found life partnership. Someone to go through the ups and downs with. Someone who would love me unconditionally. Someone who would take the time to know, understand, and accept me, and vice versa. I love you forever, lover. We thought we had time, our whole lives ahead of us, but we didn't physically in this lifetime. And I can't wait to meet you again in the next. Good morning, everyone. My dad was a multifaceted diamond. He was rare. <laughs> And unique. He had many admirable qualities that I could only hope to one day grow into. My full name, Moigua, which means the feared one, couldn't be farther from the truth. He was, he was nurturing. He was a very nurturing and welcoming soul, and frankly the opposite of intimidating. 
he was very mischievous and he had a, a cheeky giggle. I always believed that he never let his inner child grow up and that was one of the reasons we were so close. He loved to make jokes and he loved to laugh and he loved to make others laugh. And although playful, he was also very wise. We would have conversations about the most abstract and philosophical things, and I would listen to his captivating words with wonder. I wanted to learn everything from him, and I wanted to be just like him. <laughs> we would often talk about the future, and he was so optimistic. He told me about some of his plans that were big. For starters, he wanted to retire at 35, but that ship had sailed. And he wanted to buy houses all around the world to retire in. And as a good daughter would, I told him that when I'm a billionaire, he can have all the houses he wants. And we agreed that that would be our plan. Moy taught me many, many things. But I think most importantly, he taught me generosity and compassion. Moi went over and above to show his love for the people around him. He has taught me to look on the bright side of things and that emotions are never a weakness. He taught me that the first thing the world sees when you step out is how you're dressed. He taught me how to drive his car and he told me not to tell my mom. <laughs> he taught me to find humor in every situation. One thing he didn't teach me was how to go on without him. <laughs> I thought my siblings and I would have our whole lives to learn from him, but he was taken from us too soon. I wish I could have learned more from him, but I'm so grateful for the moments that I did have. I wouldn't change anything if I could go back because he did a really great job at being my dad. <laughs> side of him I wish my siblings had seen more of. I can't begin to imagine not having Moy on the end of the phone telling me that it takes 10 tickles to make an octopus laugh or tricking me into believing I woke up at 4 p.m. by closing the curtains to make it dark or using the high hungry I'm Moy line on me. Moy was such a jokester. I don't know if the dad jokes naturally kicked in when I was born or if he learned it with time, but he was very humorous. We used to have this running joke that the M on Mario merchandise stood for Moi instead of Mario and that the L stood for Lilita as opposed to Luigi. So about two days after Christmas, he came home in a red hoodie with an M on it and he was holding two wrapped gifts. He gave them to me and he watched as I opened them cautiously because he was very unpredictable. I saw something green and I threw my head back to try and contain my laughter. And he was cackling because I knew what the gift was and he knew what the gift was. And it was just hilarious that he had even thought to get me that gift. To say that I loved my dad would be an understatement. And to say that I'm going to miss him would be an even greater understatement. I already miss a lot of things about him, but it's mostly the small things that I never noticed before. I miss how he would take me to the salon with him when he got her hair cut just so that we can spend the day together. I miss how he used to sit and listen to me at H&M trying to decide which color shirt I like most. I miss how he would skip with me whenever we went out because I loved to do it and he didn't care how silly we looked. I miss how we would always be late because we both took forever to get ready. <laughs> I miss how he would say my name whenever I walked into his office after school. <laughs> I miss his smile. I miss his laughter. I miss his hugs and I miss his voice and I miss our unbreakable bond. And in my mind, I have such vivid memories of all those things, but I think about how I'll never feel them again and it's so surreal and crippling. If Moi were here, 
he told me that it's okay to be sad. But I want to end this on a slightly more positive note. My father may have died, but I will never lose him. When we lost Moe, we gained an angel forever. Thank you to Aisha and Lilita for having the courage. I know it was difficult to come and stand here and share with all of us the special moments that you had with Moikwa, but we thank you for having that courage to do so. Uh, we will now continue the service with the liturgy of the word, and we will start with the psalm. I'm going to ask the congregation to please stand. We will recite the psalm antiphonally. I will read the first verse. The congregation will read the second verse and we will alternate until the end of the verses. I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? He will not let your foot slip. He, will, he who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun shall not harm you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going, both now and evermore. Let us say together, Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Please be seated for the reading of the word. A reading from the book of Job, chapter 19, reading from verse 25 to verse 27. I know that my Redeemer lives, and that in the end he will stand on the earth. And after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes, I and not another. How my heart yearns within me. Hear, hear the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The second reading for this morning is from the Gospel of St. John. Chapter 11, reading from verse 17 to 37. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, some two miles away, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them about their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him while Mary stayed at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. Jesus said to her, 
your brother will rise. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to him, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him. Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. When she had said this, she went back and called her sister, Mary, and told her privately, the teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come to the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. The Jews were with her in the house, consoling her. So Mary get up quickly and go out. They followed her because they thought she was going to the tomb to weep there. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind men have kept this man from dying? This is the word of the Lord. Be to God. I greet you all in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Firstly, let me take this opportunity to express my gratitude to Archdeacon Moses for the generosity of spirit of inviting me to share the word today and inviting me to be part of this worship service as we say fare thee well to our brother. Allow me to greet the Sisulu and the Jackson families and of course all the other families surrounding these two families. Mamzotwa, Aisha, the siblings Zoya and Zieka, the kids Lilita, Naya and Mologuhle. And of course, the aunts and uncles and cousins and friends, and more so the ANC family and the business community with which Muyikwa interacted with every day. Today we encounter in the gospel according to St. John, Jesus in Bethany, of course, he had received news that his beloved friend Lazarus had passed on. But only after two days, he makes his way to Bethany to be with Lazarus' sisters, Mary and Martha. His disciples were not too pleased about him going back to Judea, as the people almost stoned him to death whilst he was there before. But Jesus insisted that they should go our friend Lazarus has fallen, but now I must go and wake him up. They thought Lazarus was literally asleep, but Jesus meant he had died. Thus he told them about his death. Jesus made it clear to his disciples that they need to go to Judea so that they should witness God's glorious acts and come to believe. And of course we know indeed Jesus arrives and the first sister Martha runs to him and subsequently the second sister runs to him as well. 
And both sisters say the same thing. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Of course, they were by no means blaming Jesus for coming late. They were by no means blaming Jesus for his absence when the brother had died. But to the contrary, they were testifying to their experience of the nature of Jesus and more significantly about the power of his presence. In other words, what led them to say the words they said it's because they understood the power of the presence of Jesus Christ. And they also understood the absence of Jesus Christ in times of need. So they were talking about their experience of Christ in their life journey. They both had a strong conviction on who Jesus was. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Because of the experience of Jesus, their experience of a Jesus who enables, their experience of a Jesus who is the source, the source of healing and the life-giving source. Remember, brothers and sisters, what they talk about is what Jesus has already done in their life journey. It was Jesus who he was already in their life journey. And that is why, because firstly they experienced him as a healing presence. What they saw and what they witnessed is what in him there is healing. We would know that Bartimaeus as well experienced this healing of Christ. We know the woman in the well experienced this healing of Christ. We know the man born blind also experienced this healing of Christ. In other words, they understood that for Christ, no amount of pain is painful enough. No amount of pain is big enough. When Christ is there, we feel the power of his comforting presence. When Christ is there, we feel the power of his healing presence. Aisha, I want to say to you, it may seem dark at this point. It may seem as if the future is gloom. It may seem as if you are, you are experiencing your cul-de-sac. Similarly, Mam Zodwa, it may seem the same to you. But I want to assure you as we sit here today, I want to assure you as we gather here today, that the power of Jesus Christ, the healing power of God, will visit you in a special way. The healing power of God will touch you in a special way because that is who Jesus is. That is the nature of Jesus. Brothers and sisters, history has taught us that we believe in a God who heals. We've been through it all. We've been through AIDS as well. We've been through the apartheid and the oppression. But our God has showed us that it doesn't end there. He moves us to a greater future. Even at this time, as we face this pandemic, as we face this coronavirus, that has brought chaos in our lives. I was telling Guinea, almost every week I am doing a funeral. Minimum is two funerals per week since the beginning of this year. Even though this pandemic may seem to be overwhelming us, I want to say, God's healing power is with us. God's healing power is among us. And the second thing we learn about the power of Jesus is his life-giving presence. And that is why he says to Mary and Martha, I am the resurrection. When they are still talking about the future, when they are still talking about tomorrow, Lord, we know it's going to happen in 20 years' time. He says, no, wait and see. It's already here. I am the resurrection. I am the life. In other words, death has no power over Christ. Death has no power in Jesus Christ. Yes, it may take away our bodies. Yes, it may destroy our bodies. But death can never touch our souls. Death can never touch who we are. 
Because Jesus is the source of life. And we saw this even with Ezekiel, even with the dry bones, that when Jesus comes, the dry bones get life. In other words, brothers and sisters, it is his presence that enables us for greater things. It is his presence that brings about healing within us. It is his presence that moves us to a greater life. So my, my prayer to all of us, even though we go through this pandemic, let us not camp in the pandemic. Let us not camp and put all our eyes in this pandemic. Let us work together to look beyond this pandemic. Because this pandemic, for me, is not here to stay. It is also about how we work together, how we hold our hands together, how we do what needs to be done for us to defeat this pandemic. And somebody said to me, but when is God going to answer? I said, hey, God has already answered. That is why you have a vaccine. God has already responded. God has already worked through God's blessings and gave men and women the skill and gave men and women the wisdom and the expertise to produce vaccine. What else are you expecting God to do? All we have to do is to receive what God has given us so that we may face a better life after all. The message I'm saying to Aisha, the message I'm saying to Mama Zotwa, we believe in a compassionate God. We believe in an empathetic God. And that is why the pain you feel, I do not understand it, Aisha. The pain you feel, Mama Zotwa, I do not understand it because I've never lost a partner nor have I lost a child. Even if I had done so, your pain is not my pain. My pain is not your pain. Only you and God understand the deepness of this wound. Only you and God understand the deepness of your pain. But what I want to assure you today, Aisha and Mamzotwa and the children, is that God is not about to leave you here. God is not about to let you go. Jesus, or God in Jesus Christ, will care and look after you. But finally, one thing we know about God is that God is an enabling presence. One word or one text that has been in my mind since the passing of my equal is the words we say at every funeral. Umtu o zelengumfazi ikashalake logupila lifuchane. Man born of a woman has but a short time to live. In other words, brothers and sisters, what COVID-19 has made us to be aware of what COVID-19 has taught us, we are not here forever. We are not here to stay. The sooner you begin to do what God has called you to do on this earth, the better for you. Moikwa did his best as a businessman. Moikwa did his best as a father and a partner, as a, as a, as a cousin. Moikwa did his best even politically in the family of the ANC to make sure he fulfills God's purpose for his life. What are you and I doing at this time? But God has enabled us already. God has already filled us with God's power. God has already empowered us to become in this life who God has called us to do. Teresa of Avila says, God has no feet. God has no hands. God has no eyes. Because you and I are the hands, the feet, and the eyes of God in this life. So we have been called by God to become the loving presence of God in this life. This is the time to love. This is the time not to feel a shame for ourselves. This is the time not to look down on ourselves. This is the time we need to be coming 
a blessing in this life. When Lilita shared, he shared how the father was a blessing in his life. And my question to you and I today, are you the blessing to those who surround you? Are you a blessing to those you interact with? Are you a blessing to your family? Are you a blessing to those you work with? Because God has called us to be lovers, Aisha. Our responsibility as children of God is nothing else but to be lovers of God in this world. So that through you and I, God's children may feel the power of God's love. What I am saying to you finally, COVID has taught us there is no time to have grudges. There is no time to be angry with people. There is no time to waste trying to feel ashamed for yourself. Because today might just be your last day. So the only time that is there, live each day to the best of your ability as if it was your last day on earth. And make the impact that God has called you and I to do in Jesus' name, amen. We give thanks for the wonderful words of comfort, words that are meant to uphold each one of us and especially the family. But those are the words that also concluded the words that have been shared by the family. And we lift all those together. And as we now stand and sing together the song, the hymn, Blessed Assurance. Please stand. is mine Oh what a foretaste of glory divine Heir of salvation Purchase of God Born of His Spirit Washed in His blood this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior.
basically concluding prayers, praying for the family, praying for ourselves and those that we love. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. And so we pray together the prayer that our Lord Jesus Christ taught us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Heavenly Father, by your mighty power, you gave us life and in your love have given us new life in Christ Jesus. We entrust now, Moigua, to your merciful keeping in the faith of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who died and rose again to save us and is now alive and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit in glory forever. Amen. Almighty God, Father of all mercies and giver of all comfort, we pray that you deal graciously with us and with those who mourn, especially Aisha, Zordwa, Zoya, Lilita, Naya, Melogutle, and the rest of the Jackson and the Zisulu family, friends and relatives, that casting all their care on you, they may know the consolation of your love through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Lord Christ, you spoke words of comfort to your friends Martha and Mary in their hour of sorrow. Give consolation and courage to those who mourn today, and may they find their peace and hope in you, the resurrection and the life, for your tender mercy's sake. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, you are the image of the invisible God, the firstborn from the dead. In you we have redemption and the forgiveness of sins. Keep us firm in this faith, setting our hearts on things above, so that when you appear, we too may appear with you in glory. Amen. Amen. To God the Father who loved us and made us accepted in the Beloved, to God the Son who loved us and loosed us from our sins by his own blood, to God the Holy Spirit who sheds the love of God abroad in our hearts, to the one true God, be all love and all glory for time and for eternity. Amen. 
just before the final blessing, as we have come to the end of this service, um, please be seated. And I would like to invite a member of the family, um, is it Manda, to come and give a vote of thanks, but also perhaps to give some guidance as to where to from here. Good day, everybody. I feel like uh, I'm, I'm a preacher today. Um, on behalf of the family, my name is John Gomez Sisulu, and on behalf of the family, I would like to thank everyone for the support. Um, I would like to also mention that uh, from here we will drive to Moe's house. In fact, it will be via Moe's house and then go to his home in Sentin. After which, then Moe will be taken to Lens. Um, I also would like to take this opportunity to, to thank and acknowledge the family of Aisha, you know, for entrusting the Sisulu family with, with their daughter. And um, just in terms of our tradition, we would like to acknowledge this family and uh, also to mention that uh, we would um, make time to meet with them as soon as we possibly could. I thank you very much. Thank you, Baba Shagula. Um, I think the dean was a little worried when he saw you walking up there. Um, he thought, and I must admit, I also thought there is a second sermon coming. <laughs> but we give thanks to God for all what he has led us to do this morning at this time. And now at the conclusion of this service of comfort, please receive God's blessings. The peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. Please let's stand as we sing the last hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness.
this man that we're all tuned in to hear about, the son of the soil, Moikwa Sisulu. Moikwa Zoletu Sisulu was born on the 27th of January 1980 at Baragwanath Hospital in Soweto. Moikwa was the firstborn child of Zotwa, a radiographer at Baragwanath and Zuelaka Sisulu, then editor of the Progressive New Nation newspaper. At the age of two, he was blessed with a baby sister, Zoya. The two siblings were as thick as thieves, parting only for his daily trips to the crash across the road from the Sisulu home in Orlando West. In addition to his parents, Moikwa grew up under the watchful eyes of his paternal grandmother, Albertina Sisulu, and his maternal grandmother, Mildred Mladlamba, who lived close by in his mother's childhood home in Orlando West. His mother's sister, Nomvuyo Mladlamba, was more than an aunt, she was his mum, Kulu, and her daughter, Kloliswa, fondly known as Nwabi, born in 1984, was another little sister. Growing up with Zoya, Nwabi, and his many Sisulu cousins, Moikwa had a happy childhood despite the political persecution experienced by his father and grandmother. In 1984, Zolake was awarded a Nieman Fellowship at Harvard University and he traveled to Boston with his young family for a year. Moikwa took to his new environment like a duck to water, developing a love for travel and a fascination with aeroplanes. Not long after their return to South Africa, his parents bought a house in Dube, where young Moikwa grew into his element as a playful adventurer who made friends easily. He was highly imaginative, conjuring up a bowling alley in his yard from discard planks and old stay-soft bottles as skittles. Moy started primary school at Holy Cross, Lords, in Deep Kloof. Moy was how he was affectionately known at home. At the time, Zolaka was in and out of detention for his influential role as editor of the New Nation. When Zolaka was arrested in December 1986, the two years he spent in jail were devastating for Moi, who refused to celebrate his seventh birthday until his father came out of jail. Moi and Zoya often missed school on Monday so that they could visit their father in jail. Zoyalaka was released in 1988, and in October 1989, the Susulu family celebrated the release of Walter Susulu after decades of serving a life sentence, first on Robben Island, and then in Paulsmore Prison. Another reason that 1989 was so significant for Moiko and his family was the birth of his little brother, Ziega, in December. At the age of 12, Moiko was enrolled at Sacred Heart College in Observatory. He was a confident, witty, and sociable fellow with a knack for sports 
especially basketball. He was well loved by his peers and teachers and developed many lasting friendships. In 1998, Moy started boarding with St. Albans College in Pretoria, from where he matriculated. The following year, he enrolled with Vitz for a BA degree. In 2000, he began working at Urban Brew Studios. Urban Brew Studios was an investee company of New African Investments Limited, NAIL, the black empowerment investment company in which his father was involved. From initially peering into the studios and peeking around production facilities, Moy was soon learning the trade on a highly popular sports show, Wars a Weekend. Moy joined a cohort of young, talented creatives that spawned a new non-racial, vibrant energy in broadcasting. Bitten by the media bug, he moved on to producing other entertainment shows while surreptitiously dropping out of university in the process. Barely 21 years old and not yet able to sign his company documents as a director, he co-founded Deja Projects along with some of his cousins and began hosting popular poetry slams in Johannesburg. He was fastidious about his appearance and even kept a spare shirt in his car at all times. It was therefore fitting that he began to provide image consulting to a number of emerging musicians. Around the same time, he co-founded an advertising media business, the Outdoor Media Company. He and his cousin Shaga repurposed Deja into an incubation hub that invested their time and networks in pursuit of different business projects in sports, marketing, music, restaurants, telecoms, and information technology. Moiko's remarkable optimism and resilience enabled him to seamlessly pivot from one entrepreneurial endeavor to another often successfully. His award-winning work at Urban Brew included one of South Africa's highest rated shows at the time, Castle Loud, garnering him renown and opening many doors within the entertainment industry. Moiko's great ability to nurture deep, long-lasting relationships bode very well for him, giving him the opportunity to consult extensively to music and entertainment companies. In 2005, he was appointed to the steering committee of the South African Music Awards. At the time, he was also working to develop systems and structures to support South Africa's first community TV broadcaster. On July 1, 2007, Soweto TV went live with his help and remains an entertainment staple for millions of Sowetans. In 2009, Moikwa and another Urban Brew alum, Paul Llewellyn, founded their own production company. Fuel Media quickly developed into an impactful collective of highly creative, technically excellent producers and multimedia content developers. Over the next seven years, Fuel worked with many channels, including the SABC, MTV, and Mnet's youth channels to deliver branded, television content for many key clients. Moy was very proud of his brainchild, Rise Mzanzi, which was a popular television reality show focused on developing entrepreneurial skills in 12 competing companies with a chance to win 1 million rand in business capital for the winners. This show was his way of providing business mentorship at scale he was intentional in sharing lessons from his 10-year entrepreneurial journey by mentoring and supporting younger people with business ambitions. In this vein, Moikwa co-founded and chaired Youth on the Move, a youth-driven company providing skills development, business support, and funding for emerging entrepreneurs. His close bond with his own father was his cynosure in all things having started two businesses that were a microcosm of his father's businesses. He then joined Mount Blanc Properties and Project and pursued property deals, just as his father had. In latter years, he would confess that his own love for media had connected him deeply to his father. The highlight of his time with Mont Blanc was the development of the beautiful Ilovo Edge block of offices in Ilovo. 
In 2007, Moy celebrated the birth of his daughter, Lilita. The arrival of their first grandchild brought great joy for the family, and Lilita was the apple of both her father and grandfather's eyes. Although Moiko and Lilita's mother, Asanda Ndile, parted ways, they maintained an amicable and successful co-parenting arrangement. Around 2010, Moigwa began work on his most ambitious project to date, the development of a coal terminal on Guazulu Natal's north coast. Over the next two years, he would dedicate himself to understanding South Africa's commodity value chains and logistic chains. He was inspired by and actively encouraged by his father, who had himself developed an interest in commodities and was on the verge of concluding a transaction in this sector when he fell ill and passed away in 2012. Moigwa became CE of the Sisulu family office, taking up his father's board seats on numerous companies. Under his stewardship, the group concluded the acquisition of commodities trader Orpot, and it grew the African capital property portfolio and advanced the Kudumani manganese resources KMA, from an exploration license into one of the top five manganese producers in SADC. Under his stewardship, the group concluded the acquisition of commodities trader Orput, grew the African capital property portfolio, and advanced the development of Kudumane manganese resources KMA, from an exploration license into one of the top five manganese producers in SADC. Other businesses shepherded under his watch included a mobile distribution company of branded headsets to local mobile operators, a jet fuel trading platform across SADC, and the importation of natural gas and other mining operations. He had recently begun the development of an industrial terminal port in the Eastern Cape. Even as he began to meet and mingle with very important people across SADC, the Americas, China, and East Asia, Moigwa remained accessible and in touch with many of his childhood friends. And also, he took immense pleasure in developing relationships with people much older than he was. Moigwa applied some of his business success and ever-expanding networks to supporting social and political causes. These include the Giant Flag Project, a crowd-funded green community development initiative. This project created a huge South African flag viewable from space, made up of millions of colored desert plants and solar panels. In 2015, CNN named this initiative one of 10 ideas to change the world. Moigwa also participated in and supported ANC Youth League initiatives and political campaigns. He was particularly attentive to the needs of under-resourced ANC branches. He believed that supporting internal democracy by sponsoring principled and hard-working candidates was key to improving the larger political environment in South Africa and abroad. Consequently, he began to fundraise for ever more high-profile candidates such as Lindiwe Sisulu, his aunt in South Africa, and even the late President Moas of Haiti. In 2016, his role of fundraiser expanded and he became the campaign manager for LS17. This was an intra-party presidential campaign that he believed could reinvigorate the traditional values of the ANC. He threw himself tirelessly into this work Chris crossing the country to drum up support, where very often the challenging conditions were compounded by a huge donor differential between candidates. Nonetheless, Moiko was pleased when his candidate of choice made it onto the ballot, but disappointed that the contest ended there. Learning firsthand of the unforgiving and exhausting nature of politics. Taking a break, soothing his heart, and immersing himself in his love for art and other fine things in life, Moigwa soon met and fell in love with Aisha Jackson. Four days after Valentine's Day 
in 2017. On the 19th, on the 19th of July 2021, they welcomed the birth of a son named Melogurle by his father. A few days after the birth of Melogurle, Moikwa and Aisha fell ill with COVID-19 and were hospitalized together. Aisha recovered and was able to return home after a fortnight. Tragically, after three weeks in ICU at Morningside Clinic, Moikwa passed away on the morning of Saturday, the 28th, August 2021, with his family by his side. Moikwa will always be remembered for his gregarious nature, his personable manner, his sharp wit, huge grin, and his rousing laugh. Generous to a fault, he channeled his grandfather, Walter Sisulu, in how he gave so much of his time and the resources that he shared. Wise beyond his years, his unwavering vision and leadership, and the audaciousness of his ideas and ambitions for Africa will be sorely missed. Moikwa leaves behind a treasure trove of memories for his life partner Aisha, his three children, Lilita, Naya, and Melogutle, his beloved mom, Zotwa, his siblings, Zoya and Ziega, and his entire clan. Collectively, we mourn his passing, overwhelmed by the weight of this loss, and yet filled with gratitude for the undisputed mark he has made. Lala ngotolo mzondi, ziega, sampu, tambele nyoge, tabuli mzondayo.